many of the true crimes described in vintage murders involve places that the time definitely forgot. Even so, the town of Colford, with just over 9,000 souls, has a place in the history books. It is the administration centre of the Forest of Dean and is three miles away from the Welsh border. It boasts the largest number of wild boar in the United Kingdom, but our tale involves a murder that occurred in 1928. Over to you, James, to fill us in on the details. Harry Pace was both a quarryman and a small-scale breeder of sheep. He was also a shocking individual with an unwholesome reputation for domestic violence and a part-time seducer of other women and girls as young as 12. Unfortunately, too many men could be classified as that type. But Harry Pace was in a class of his own, as he would bark like a dog and scratch himself until he bled or his hair fell out. His unsavoury sexual reputation was not just a subject of rumours. In November 1926, the parents of Miss Childs threatened to take him to court for indecent assault. Harry asked his wife to pay them seven shillings and sixpence, equal to 38 pence today, for them to drop the matter. She paid up. He lived, along with his long-suffering wife, Beatrice Pace, at Fetter Hill in Colford, with their five children. They had had a total of ten children, but five of them had already died. The brood would have been higher if Harry had not persuaded Beatrice to take some pills, which induced an abortion. The key to this story is the perception of Harry Pace, according to other accounts at the time. His family claimed that the Paces were happy and that Harry cared for his wife. A touching tribute. But Beatrice and her children told a very different story. He was said to be violent with erratic mood swings and would often beat his wife. On one occasion, he beat her with a wire rope and she had to flee to her father's house. He turned up with a gun and threatened to shoot her. On another occasion, he was so enraged by the killing of a sheep on the railway line that he flew into a rage and crushed Beatrice's dog against a wall. But like all true British villains, he was known to hurt his dogs and his sheep. In early 1927, he actually threw his wife and family out of the house, and Beatrice had to visit the police to arrange to be returned home. Pace's relatives refused to believe his dreadful behaviour, and took a dislike to Beatrice. They accused her of adultery, although there is no evidence of this claim. In particular, she was close to the Say family, of which more later. In May 1927, Harry Pace went to see his doctor and complained of stomach pains and some vomiting of blood. He was prescribed bismuth and soda, as it could either be a gastric ulcer or gastritis. There was some improvement, but in July there were symptoms of paralysis in his feet and hands. As a sheep breeder, Harry would have dipped his sheep on a regular basis. Sheep dip at the time involved a combination of arsenic and sulphur. The contents were kept in a sheep dip box, and in July Beatrice bought two bottles from a local chemist. The importance of this purchase cannot be underestimated, as the police found only one bottle. Beatrice claimed that her daughter had discovered a used bottle in the main bedroom. The inference being that her husband had drunk it. The next day, Harry, together with some of his children, dipped the lambs in a dolly tub. The adult sheep would be dipped next month. Within days, Harry was ill again. He went to work but returned home, complaining of pains to his stomach and head. He was also vomiting. He went to bed, but his family were unhappy with the care that Beatrice was providing. His mother visited the house, but wanted to be left alone with her son, even though Beatrice had refused. By August, he had lost the power of his limbs and could not walk, and he was transferred to Gloucester Infirmary. The medical officer thought he had caught arsenic poisoning from the sheep dipping. At the hospital, a patient saw him crying, 
and noted that he said he would commit suicide if things did not get better. On the 24th of October, Harry left the hospital, though he was still unable to walk. He eventually got better, but was unable to explain the matter of the empty bottle containing sheet dip found in his bedroom. But the spell in hospital had not changed Harry's ways, as he was able to start to walk again. On Christmas Day, he threatened to attack his wife and one of his daughters, Dorothy, with a pair of tongs. He later produced a razor and threatened them. They fled the house and only returned when he had calmed down. On Boxing Day, Harry's condition worsened again, and Beatrice was forced to contact the doctor. On the 10th of January, Harry died. The death certificate gave the cause of death as influenza, gastroenteritis and inflammation of the limbs. The Pace family were not satisfied, and his brother, Elton, went to Colford Police Station to voice his concerns. The police had to act, and the Pace family, minus Harry, were contacted. The key suspect was Beatrice, and in particular, arsenic in the house. She told the inspector that she thought the recent sheep dip left over had probably been burnt. The funeral of Harry Pace was postponed until after the hearing of the coroner's court. When it commenced on the 16th of January, it soon had to be adjourned, as Beatrice was seen to be on the verge of collapse and had to be taken home. This type of behaviour was to be reported many times at dramatic moments in the coming months. Harry Pace was eventually buried, but a post-mortem analysis of his organs showed that it contained 9.42 grains of arsenic. The coroner's court involved several expert witnesses. They all agreed that exposure to the sheep dip would only involve 0.2 grains of arsenic. The person would need to ingest it through a cut or by mouth. It would appear that someone had administered the poison to the unlovable Harry Pace. But who? After a number of sessions, the jury gave their verdict. Before they reached their decision, the coroner emphasised that death could not have been by accident and it was inconceivable that a man would repeatedly try to poison himself. He then pointed out there was only one person who was providing him with sustenance but the jury's decision was that an unknown person had administered the arsenic and it needed further investigation. This did not satisfy the coroner, who insisted that a person had to be named. After an hour, they delivered another verdict and named Beatrice Pace, who became hysterical. On the 2nd of July 1928, Beatrice was tried at Bristol Assizes, before Mr Justice Horridge. The case reached the national press and there were huge crowds wishing to gain admission to the court. Apart from Harry Pace's relatives, there was almost universal sympathy for his widow. Socialist MP A. A. Purcell put together a defence fund of £1,300 to hire the renowned King's Counsel Paul Burkett. He is today famous for being at the Nuremberg trials of Nazi leaders. He was certainly silver-tongued. After four days, the judge directed the jury to declare her not guilty. There was unanimous cheering, and this time Beatrice did not faint. Given the amount of media coverage, it was inevitable that the newspapers wanted a story. Beatrice sold her memoirs to the Sunday Express in a six-part series between the 8th of July and the 12th of August. As this is normally called the silly season in Fleet Street, with such classics as eggs being fried on car bonnets, you can understand the large sum of money that was paid. In it, she recounts her youth, marriage and experiences as a murder suspect. She tells of a loving mother and being a caring wife and of an abusive husband. She did not blame the police, and even praised the prison authorities. Not long after the trial, Beatrice's relationship with her friends the Says broke down, and our old friend Checkbook Journalism is to blame. 
Whilst Alice Say was certainly a bosom friend, the same could not be said of her husband, who told the newspapers what he called the real story. She could not be tried again under the double jeopardy rule, but it was a sensational story that even reached the press in Australia. Beatrice's reputation was not helped by a letter sent from prison, with the words, Keep your tongues quiet. But there was one fatal flaw in this story. He claimed that she used the sheep dip in his sandwiches, but that would mean sulphur in his organs, which was not there. Mr Say was lucky not to be tried for libel. The coroner had been technically correct, as the coroner's court could only level a charge but he was pilloried in the press. Her case reached Parliament and the Labour MP, Will Thorne, questioned the Home Secretary that a 13-hour interrogation through the night by Scotland Yard detectives amounted to third-degree style questioning. This was denied by the Home Secretary. For those who advocate the return of the rope, irrespective of the circumstances of the case, please bear in mind these facts. If there had been no defence advocate of the statue of Paul Burkett, it is probable that Beatrice would have been found guilty and the judge would have had no alternative but to don the black cap and sentence the culprit to the gallows. Legal aid was just starting to be established, but as was pointed out in the press, the state could appoint the finest barristers for the prosecution, but the defence would have to be wealthy all depend on the charity of others if they wanted a king's counsel. At that point, her fate rested in the hands of Johnson Hicks, the then Home Secretary. Under his watch, all culprits went to the gallows, despite opposition in the form of public opinion. He condemned many men to the scaffold, and it is safe to say that Beatrice would be joining Harry in the afterlife. The Daily Express in particular was scathing about the coroner, as it implied his job was to accept the findings of the jury and not to redirect them to another conclusion. Shades of the people's court in Nazi Germany here. Modern audiences would be forgiven for saying that Beatrice should have filed for divorce, but things were very different in 1928. Divorce was only for the raffish wealthy and could lead to social exclusion. If Beatrice could afford the fees, she would have to prove adultery and one other cause. Men only had to prove adultery. For the lower orders, a man could put a woman up for auction and allow others to bid for her. This was being reported in the 1920s, and it is not the stuff of Thomas Hardy novels. Harry Pace was more interested in beating Beatrice than selling her. Anyway, who is going to make his tea? Now, John, this is a brutal story. Give us your opinions on the events that occurred. You do have to wonder about contemporary attitudes in the Forest of Dean. Modern audiences would be horrified if a couple accepted any money if they discovered that their daughter had been the subject of an undecent assault. But the coroner's summing up was extraordinary. If a man is evidently sane, then he is unlikely to consume arsenic, especially if he's in the sheep breeding business. But Harry Pace was not exactly sane at the best of times. Mutilating yourself and being known to contemplate suicide is not concrete evidence of a sane person at the best of times. One of the great differences between the legal systems in the United Kingdom is that the Scottish courts recognise the concept of not proven. This is impossible under the law in England and Wales, hence the dilemma of the coroner. The whole story seems to have echoes of Fred West, though there were no bodies under the patio. A horribly dysfunctional family and its consequences. Did she murder him? Probably, but it shows the danger of relying on a childish view of justice. A judge who is prevented from reducing a man's sentence to one of life imprisonment and a Home Secretary who is appointed on the whim of a Prime Minister. You have to wonder. 